Hello and welcome to episode 107 of Third and Wrong. I'm your co-host Stephen Bullen and I'm joined as always by Zach Foth and Ozzy Dalalonga. We're uh, extremely fired up to have Ben Grant on the podcast here. He's a podcaster and writer for X's and Argos, which that is a, that is a really creative name. I'm, I'm quite jealous. Uh, he writes on Canadian football perspective and he's a coach at Lauren Park Secondary School in Mississauga and he coaches the GTA All-Stars, the semi-pro team who um, many might be familiar with when our interview with Kelsey Fender, uh, the team that Ben coached uh, defeated the team that Kelsey played on. So Kelsey, if you're listening, really sorry. Ben, thank you for joining us, my friend. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. And I got to say, in terms of creative podcast names, Third and Wrong is is pretty awesome. So you can't you can't really beat that. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Thank you very much. Um, I guess just kind of hopping into it here, what do you make right now of the current landscape of, you know, the CFL, XFL merger, obviously a lot of talk of MLSC being involved in pushing for the merger talks. Um, we'll get the elephant in the, out of, in the room out of the way first, and then we'll get to some football. Sounds good. I, I don't know what to make of it. it. It's making me nervous. There's no question. The fact that there's mostly silence from the league, I don't think can be interpreted as a good thing in any way. It reminds me a lot of last year. And that's what some of the players I've talked to over the last couple of weeks, especially, have been increasingly anxious about the fact that the league has really said nothing. So the XFL thing thrown into that just to add to the confusion and then add to the fire, I, I don't think is great. Um, the, the MLSE, I like to call them conspiracy theories uh, at this point, because we don't know anything yet. But that seems to be coming largely out of the West. We really haven't heard too much talk of it. The only talk that has been generated on this end has come from guys like Rod Peterson and, and other sources from the West. And so in, in our sort of, you know, east side of Canada kind of way, we just sort of ignore it. Uh, but it's, uh, there, there may be something to it. You know, I think these sources are probably credible. And so there's got to be something to it. But I, I don't know. I, I just don't know the extent of it. It just sounds... It sounds a little far-fetched to me. I think the Argos have done a great job putting a team together. Toronto's pretty excited about this group of Argonauts, and that isn't always the case, as I'm sure you guys know. <laughs> and, and so if you're, trying to, if you're trying to sabotage things or bring the league down or bring the team down, I don't think you go about building what looks like a, a pretty solid roster and getting the city excited about a, a franchise. Creating a bunch of hype for a team that didn't have any hype the last season that we actually uh, had a full season. So it's kind of funny that that would even be the case. Um, let's assume then that there is a full season in 2021 or a shortened season, whatever you want to say. Um, and then speaking of those Argos acquisitions, are there still holes on the roster that they didn't address or what are your kind of thoughts? Um, are there any moves that they can address in the draft next month? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I am so unfamiliar with this year's draft class. I felt really comfortable with last year's group. A lot of them were Ontario based. I had either coached a lot of them or coached against them. This class, I just don't know very well. And on top of that, I didn't get to see them play any U sports football this year. So I'm really in the dark. I know the needs. We, we could use some defensive backs. I think that's if you're looking for a hole in this roster, they don't have that many offensive linemen under contract, but they're good. They're solid guys that we've largely taken from Saskatchewan. And <laughs> the, you know, the, the quarterback that we've taken from Calgary and the receiving core that we've taken from Calgary and Edmonton, I, I feel good about the, the running backs. The linebackers are all Canadians. So really it's just the defensive backs. And I'm okay with them. But if there's a spot on the team where I'm just like, hmm, I don't know. I, I don't know how deep we're going there. That would be it. And so if you're looking for help in the draft, I think defensive back. And so we, we've got some good Canadians there, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure it's a position of strength. We are uh, Adams. will be dicing up the uh, <laughs> secondary oh, there. Man. Let's let, well, yeah, for, for their sake, let's hope not. But um, <laughs> Quick uh, follow up to that, Ben, we had Shane Richards on for a hundredth episode and he was a great interview. And we asked him where he sees himself fitting in on the offensive line. He said he can play tackle. He can play guard, but he, I believe he said he preferred tackle or kind of saw himself as a tackle kind of making sense of the offensive line there. Where do you see him? Uh, you know, the former first overall pick in 2019, where do you see him fitting into the picture? 
he, especially now, looks like a tackle. He's lost a lot of weight. He's, he's kept himself really fit. And that's, you know, that's going to be an interesting thing, too, is when camp starts, you know, what does everybody look like? Not everybody has been posting workout updates on, on their Twitter account. So we'll see what kind of shape everyone's in. But yeah, Shane Richards is a guy that has kept himself in, not just kept himself in shape, he's actually in way better shape. He looks like he's dropped mm -hmm. about 50 pounds back down to his, his Oklahoma State playing weight, maybe even a little bit under. And that looks to me like a tackle. He's six foot eight. I hate having really tall guards. And yet I've kind of projected him at, at, at least to start the season being a backup guard. And the reason for that is just listening to Coach McAdoo talk last year, and I know it's a year ago and I know things have changed. He seemed to be suggesting that he's comfortable having these, we've got four linemen who are six foot eight. And <laughs> he, he likes these guys on the inside, which again, to me, it, it drives me crazy. I, I can't imagine how any quarterback would want two six foot eight guards in front of them. But he's got a couple of these guys that he mentioned as being possible guards in uh, in Richards and, and Mo Simba. So I, I've got him penciled in there for now, but I do think like he's just, I think he's a way more natural tackle. If I were the line coach, I, I don't think I would even think about him at guard. Man, I'm, I'm loving all this, uh, all this insight on the Argos as I haven't got to talk much here, Ben, but I'm a huge <laughs> Argos fan. Um, I've been a fan before the 2012 gray cup and uh, got to see them win 2012 and 2017. And I absolutely loved it. Um, I kind of want to jump on the expectations here and talk a little bit about that. You know, you alluded to uh, Arbuckle coming over from Calgary, and now we have Dinwiddie as our head coach. Um, Steve ranked those uh, boys number nine or the ninth best duo between quarterback. I and caught head that. Coach. I caught that. <laughs> so I, I want your your feel on that. You know. How are you feeling about him ranking it there? And where well, do you put them and your expectation? When I listened to last week's podcast episode, I thought something had gone wrong with my phone because I thought somehow I had jumped forward to number one by accident. And I was like, <laughs> wait a second, what happened to the other eight here? But no, he had he had them ranked nine. And so, look, I, I get, Steve, I get where you're coming from. They're they're unproven. And we're we've got guys that are in very different roles because Coach Dinwiddie, he wasn't, it's not like he was the offensive coordinator really in Calgary. He was a quarterback's coach. He's made a jump of two levels. We don't know what he's going to be like as a head coach. We've got uh, technically Jarius Jackson is the offensive coordinator. He hasn't worked in this capacity before with Dinwiddie or with, or with Arbuckle. And do we even know what Arbuckle is? We've got a seven game sample size. I think he looks great in those seven games. I'm excited about it, but there are some causes for concern. When I go back and watch his film or go back and watch his Georgia State film, he, he looks really good most of the time, but there are some questions. He's got weaknesses in that sort of uh, mid-level range, the 10 to 20 yard range. He, his accuracy isn't there for some reason. He's, he's reluctant to throw between 10 and 20. You see it, uh, you know, he's far more comfortable with the checkdowns, uh, dumping it off to backs or taking a deep shot in, especially against zero, but um, a, a cover one as well. Uh, he doesn't mind those, those man matchups. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there are some reasons to worry. So I get why he's nine. I think that's, it's a safe play, Steve. I think by the end of the yeah. year, uh, I think we may have to re-rank some of those guys. I have a Absolutely. lot of faith in them. I think coach Dinwiddie's going to be really good. I think Nick Arbuck is going to be really good too, but they haven't done anything yet. So building off that though, like are you at all concerned with like Dinwiddie being a first time head coach with the shortened season with how things are like going into the season? We're not sure how things are looking and all that, like building a culture is definitely not easy. Right. Uh, we do see kind of quick turnarounds at times. Um, but you know, there's a lot of expectation there, right? Yeah. It's, it's funny because he wasn't really brought in for this team. We got to remember that he was brought in last year when the team was in the process of year one of a rebuild. And so the right. team that they had in front of them last year, there were over 30 guys that they signed last year who aren't even on the team anymore. So never even got a chance to take a snap, <laughs> but over 30 guys, like 30, I think it's 33 now. So the team that he was brought in to coach was a young team, a fairly inexperienced team, a rebuilding team. And that's the perfect situation for a rookie head coach. Now 
you look at the roster and it's a, it's a, it's a team of all-stars and former NFL pros. And is this the kind of situation that a rookie head coach can go into and immediately get the locker room on board? I think the fact that he's had two off seasons to kind of work this through has helped. He's had time, but it's one thing to do this on zoom calls and, and from your office, it's another thing out in the field. I think it's going to be really tough. I, I, I think I'm optimistic, but I think he's got the hardest job in, in the CFL next year in terms of the coaches. You, um, you mentioned some of the big names that have come in and we've alluded to that as far as some of the bigger s- signings, such as like, you know, Martavis Bryant, um, Kendall, Wright, Bishop Sankey, which I think might've been a year old and some of these former NFL names, and then you tack on, you know, Charleston Hughes, Odell Willis, which, and I may be putting you on the spot, which of these kind of big name, big splash signings are you the highest on? And which one are you maybe warning Argos fans to be a little more cautious about? That's a good question. The names that I'm actually highest on aren't the big names because we've had such, such a poor history as a league in taking NFL stars or at least notable names, first round draft picks, or like in the case of Martavis Bryant, he's a, I think he's a fourth round pick, but he had uh, some celebrity. He was, you know, made some famous catches or Cincinnati Bengals fans would argue non catches in playoff games and, Mm. um, and, and Super Bowl appearances. So we, we don't typically turn guys like that into good CFL players for whatever reason, as a league, we fail in that regard. So there are actually some, some signings I'm really excited about that aren't necessarily the high profile guys. Now of the high profile guys, I'm interested. I, I want to see what Kendall Wright can do if he still got what, what it takes. And, and I'm not sure. I, I talked to, I talked to the guys from uh, Lockdown Vikings because that was sort of his last stop just to sort of see, well, what did, what did he look like? And the report wasn't overly positive. It sounded like they saw a player that wasn't overly motivated, that was maybe taking things for granted. And maybe he's picked things up. Maybe that was a wake up call he needed. And he realized, look, if I want to play, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to be what I was before and he'll regain his form. But, but maybe not, you know, maybe this isn't the right scenario for him. Martavis Bryant, I, I was a little bit skeptical of, but apparently now he's so motivated that he's signed an indoor football league contract with the Massachusetts Pirates <laughs> just to get himself in CFL shape, he says. So if that's the case, then that sounds motivated to me. So, you know, that's an exciting one. So I, I, I guess, you know, and I love Bishop Sankey. I don't know if it's because of my 2015 fantasy football team or you know just watching him play <laughs> watching him play in college like he was he was incredible and he didn't he never really quite got it with the titans but i'm excited about him too that's awesome uh one more name i want to pick your brain about and then we'll move on to our uh, to another question uh and i'm probably gonna butcher his first name i hope not but dejon Brissett, he was a first round pick i believe in last year's draft and uh, Canadian receiver you had him in one of your articles kind of penciled in at that Z receiver position I believe that's the field side kind of far far side receiver position obviously they're, they're not going to get a lot of targets out there as you were you were explaining to me but what are the expectations for a young Canadian receiver like him and can he make some waves in a really crowded receiver room with Devaris Daniels Eric Rogers uh, Breskison and I think that's going to depend on how many Canadians Coach Dinwiddie wants to go with at the receiver position. Most teams, as you guys know, have at least two Canadians out there. The Argos have a bit of a luxury in that both of their linebacker spots are going to be Canadians in, in Cameron Judge and Enoch Muamba. And so that combined with probably four Canadians at offensive line means that you really don't need to have that that two or three Canadian receiver look that a lot of teams go with. So if the Argos decide just one Canadian receiver, then he's going to be in a really tough battle. I think Juwan Breskison is probably the guy that, that they're going to go with in that case. If they decide to go with two Canadians, then I think he's got a real shot. And the Z is a nice spot for him. It is a little wider out usually, but not every formation is, is out of base. So he's not always going to find himself a mile away from the quarterback. Uh, he's a really good receiver. What I like about him, he, he's fantastic at tracking the ball you watch his stuff uh, not so much from Virginia because he didn't really get much time there but when he played for Richmond his ability to see to know exactly where the ball is going to land basically as soon as it leaves the quarterback's fingers he has that amazing ability that you see the the best center fielders you know the ball off the bat they immediately know 
where to go and wide receivers the same way. And he just uses his body so well. He's got a bit of a basketball background like Breskison and he does the same thing. I, I love watching him track balls down the sidelines. Arbuckle's great at knowing his guys, knowing the strengths that he's throwing to you. Watch the way he throws jump balls for Breskison, the way he uses, uh, the way he used like Reggie Bailton, for example, the way he used Eric Rogers with his height. So with, with a guy like Brissett, he's going to learn pretty quickly. He can throw him contested catch situations. So Brissett loves to get in tight with DBs. He actually invites contact. He doesn't try to run away from everybody. And then knowing where that ball is going to be at that last second, sort of chicken wings a little bit out of there and, and makes a great catch. And he's so much fun to watch. So I hope he gets time. He's good. He's good enough. So, uh, you know, hopefully this will, will be his chance. And I know he's really motivated too. That's awesome. I'm really excited for him because I love those underdog stories where they can potentially, especially in like a, a crowded receiver room that you have with former NFL stars, proven CFL veterans. So I'm, I'm really rooting for him, you know, just as an outsider. He's, um, he's an exciting story too, just because like, and last year it was so disappointing because we had Natea J. And unfortunately, uh, he's now in Montreal. He never got to suit up for, for the Argos this time around. But you've got Natea J, Breskison, and Dejan Brissett, who all grew up basically blocks from each other in Mississauga. They all knew each other. They all trained together. And there they were all on the same team. Unfortunately, Natea J is now in Montreal. But uh, it's just to have those two guys there. They're good buddies. They get along really well. And you know they're probably going to be playing next to each other starting for Toronto this year. That's awesome. That's going to be really great. Um, well, we've talked a lot of current Argos, uh, Ben, but let's take a look back. Um, I guess, first of all, this, to kind of preface this question, how long have you been an Argos fan? It started for me, I was really young. I, I guess it was early 80s and Conrad Holloway came to town and he just lit the city on fire. It, there was this electricity that I'd never really seen before. I'd been a football fan for about six months. My The Bengals were actually my first love. Their 1981 Super Bowl run with their tiger striped helmets really caught my attention as a, as a young child. And then it was, I guess it was the following season with Holloway coming into town. And, and I was suddenly like, wait a second, we have, we have a football team. There's, I, I can go and watch this. I can cheer for this, this guy. And then of course they, they go on and win the gray cup. And so you know, it was, it was pretty much set in stone. That was it for me. Uh, no looking back. And there've been some tough moments. <laughs> there've been some, some dry spells uh, for the Argos, but as a long suffering Bengals fan, I'm well-trained for that. So uh, I'm, uh, I, I, you know, the, I ride the highs and lows, you know, they, they go, in, you know, nine and nine and win the great cup or they, you know, or, or they go, you know, four and uh, four and 14 and, and you kind of forget about it late in the fall. Zach can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I, I was uh, I was about to say. Um, first of all, you're you're a Bengals fan. I'm a Browns fan, so we'll, oh, we don't I'm, agree there. I'm sorry to However, hear. Here, I thought you liked football. Oh, oh my heart. Hey, man. Hey, <laughs> look where them Browns are now. Okay, it's true. This has got to be an awkward <laughs> feeling for you going into the draft, not having a top three pick. You must feel very odd about the whole scenario. It's actually disturbingly weird for me i still feel like i'm like tracking i'm still watching the draft in depth but it's like weird for me not like almost over analyzing it <laughs> as i as i did before because we were always in the position to you know get that franchise changing player we still gotta do good but i mean it's it is different um but we can get along with the argos here i i love that's that. true <laughs> um uh, i do oh. Go oh, ahead, Zach. I was going to um, jump in and uh, ask a little bit about uh, the grassroots. You're, you're a coach um, and, you know, it might be a little different from Alberta, um, you know, out West to out East, but what kind of investment, like, do we need to put into the grassroots level to grow the game here in Canada and uh, your uh, opinion on that? It's such a hard question. And I, I don't have the answer to that. I have some thoughts, but mm. it's, it's, I think it goes deeper than, because it's not really about football, at least in Ontario anyway. And I think it's probably the same in a lot of places in Canada. I know like football is really popular out West and it's got a huge popularity in Quebec it's at some levels in Ontario. But really to me, the question is more about sports in general. Like you, here's an example. So um, 
so my wife was a tennis player. She won the national championship in university for McMaster, played in Edmonton. And so there you've got a, a basically a U sports or I guess it was CIAU at the time championship. And there are 10 people there watching. That's just, that's, but that's Canada, right? And you go conversely, uh, even you know, sport to sport, you look at tennis championships in the States and the place is packed, it's crowded. You go to watch any sport in the States and the stands are filled. And we do an okay job with, with hockey, but still not to that level. Because again, look at university hockey teams. I've watched York and U of T and, and Ryerson and all these teams play and it's not packed uh, and it's great hockey. But you go down to Michigan and watch their hockey team and the place is packed. And so it's not really a football question to me. It's, it's more a sports question of why aren't we as rabidly passionate ab about sports? And I, I think part of it builds a, a, in the, just the absolute youth. Um, I, I don't mean to hog the mic, but just to, to yeah, relay another, another story just came to mind here. So a few years ago, we, had, we started this tradition of, of taking high school teams down to the States to play. And we know what high school football like is in the States. It's, it's a whole different thing from here. But one of the things that really opened my eyes, so we had a practice the day before scheduled on their field, which is a 10,000 seat stadium in a town of 11,000 people, which is also <laughs> like <laughs> stunning. And we're practicing. But as we're getting ready for our practice, we notice outside on the like five different side fields, you've got every other age group practicing. And you've got six-year-olds that are running a very simplified version of the playbook of the team that we're going to play the next day. You've got eight-year-olds running a slightly more complex version of that same playbook. You've got, you know, then the grade seven and eight team, and you've got the JV team that are running now almost the entire playbook. And then you've got the varsity team. And so from the age of six, you're preparing to one day be in that 10,000 seat stadium in front of everybody. But it's not just the football players, the guys in the band are just as excited about one day being in that marching band. And this is a high school of like 400, 500 kids. And we can't, we, we don't have anything like that. There's nothing like that. And as much as we're a, a hockey crazy country and we, we love sports, I really think we do love sports, not in the same fanatical way. <laughs> and so I don't know how to fix that because it seems to me to be just such a, a, a massive cultural difference between the US and Canada in the way that we look at at competitive sports. I think I was gonna Yeah, well, that's that was so well said. Go ahead, Zach. I was gonna add to that. I was like, you know, us talking about like Dinwiddie building the culture and all that. It's so similar on like a bigger scale, obviously. We gotta almost build that culture. It's it's interesting you talk about how it it jumps from um uh every grade up to the next one. Um you said that and it it resonated with me because I coached for a uh, Bantam team and my head coach uh, had just come up to me and started pitching that same thing. And he was doing his research of uh, things that they do down in the States. And it's just cool that we're hearing this from every side of uh, uh, Canada. So potentially we can all kind of start working that into our systems and hopefully it builds more of a culture there. I just, I'm all fired up right now. So uh, <laughs> I, I love it. Um, Steve, did you want to add something there? Yeah, I think I you made a good point across a broad spectrum of sports. That's the case too. Cause I mean, even in Western Canada, you go to a medicine at Tigers game or the WHL or Canadian hockey league as a whole. And you got four to 5,000 people in, in the arena that night. Um, you know, we university of Lethbridge, Lethbridge just an hour and a half away. You go to university of Lethbridge pronghorns game. And I, I'm not sure how many people they get there. It's not too much, obviously not as much as their WHL team. So there's, yeah, there's almost like a, dichotomy there like of just such a difference and and i think you know on a, if you want to go back out to such a big picture view we're always comparing ourselves and we shouldn't the cfl to the nfl and like how big scale and i think you have to realize just how unique and out there the nfl is as far as that, just the craze that fans feel for that stuff and it's it's kind of on a just a we only really have that with our canadian nhl teams and even in some cases like you know, the senators struggle to fill up their stadium when, you know, pre-pandemic. So it is interesting that maybe we shouldn't be so caught up in comparing ourselves to how the United States does it. Cause I think just culturally it's different, but
but we still need to figure out a way to get people more engaged with what's going on. I think that's what Jim Mullen, president of football Canada is trying to do and just kind of connecting everyone from the CFL down to the grassroots, but it's a large task. It's going to take a long time. And I think this, the CFL does a really good job. I, I think there's still other things that they can do, but you know, we've had, we've had a lot of Argonauts at our practices helping out. They're always very visible in the community. They're really good. Anytime I get in touch with them and, and, you know, Hey, can you, can you send us a guy or do you mind if, if so-and-so comes by and helps us with this and, or promote this event, they're fantastic with that stuff. Uh, but it still hasn't translated. And it's, it's a thing where, and this is a, a bit of a CFL problem too. I can't tell you how many times I've had players, good football players, guys that are going to go and play U sports football that have, couldn't even name the CFL teams. Mm. They, they are aware of the Argonauts, the Tiger Cats. I don't think they could tell you exactly how many teams there are in the league but they can name you the starting lineup of pretty much any NFL team. And that's right. an issue. And these are guys that love football, that are obsessed with football, just not Canadian football, even though they play it. That's the game they play and the yeah. game they're going to be playing in U sports. It's so interesting. And there's so many ideas out there. Like, you know, I, a lot of people on Twitter are like, well, if only we had a video game or if only, you know, they got more involved in the grassroots or like a rational Danny was saying, if only they were more involved in flag football. And I think, those are all things like it. It's not a one solution fix all kind of thing. I think all these things have to happen and they have to happen year over year to build that steady fan base. I'm just not sure that's happened, you know, from the nineties on, it, you know, I, I can only go back so far as far as my knowledge goes. But one thing I would like to see is football today is so much safer than it used to be. And I think that that's, I don't think that fixes the problem. I don't think that like a safety awareness campaign sort of pointing out and saying, hey, look, these are all the changes that have been made. I don't, I don't think that fixes this problem, but I, th- I think it helps. I think there are, because that's not, when I started coaching, I, I never saw, I, I, I never saw people reluctant to play because of safety concerns or parents reluctant to have their kids play. And I do see that now. And I totally understand that as a parent. I, I get that. I understand that worry. But looking at what, changes the game has undergone in the past 10 years it's really quite remarkable you look at the the helmets that there are now compared to the like the r- ridiculous looking helmet that i once played in and you compare the the awareness uh, just the concussion awareness concussion protocols these we didn't have anything close to those things because we were playing an unsafe sport we were playing a sport that right. we just didn't we didn't know better and coaches didn't know better and the community didn't know better. There wasn't that awareness, but now there is. And now it is, it, it, it's still not a hundred percent. It's still a violent game and it's still a dangerous sport to play as is hockey, as is rugby, as are a, a lot of contact sports, but it is so much safer than it was. And I'd love to see a little bit more, I guess, spreading that awareness, just letting people know, Hey, these are the changes that have been made. This is, this is why concussions are a serious problem. And this is what we've done about them. Well said. I, I, <clears throat> exactly. And that's always a topic that's going to come up uh, regardless. And making it, making things safer is is always great. If that's at a young age starting um, with the hitting um, or maybe going to more of a flag football setup. There's, there's tons of options and I'd love to talk to you about those too. It's super exciting. And flag football um, is amazing. Like, why don't we yeah. see more of that too? Like my kids are involved in it now and it's Man, that's exciting stuff. And it's, it's got right. almost everything that's there in the game of football, but it's also got an extra layer of inclusivity. And mm-hmm. so I, I really like that sport. I wish you could turn on the TV, turn on TSN and see flag football. Very occasionally, very rarely, you'll catch something on NFL Network or something like that where it's a, a really high profile tournament. But right. that's a fun sport to watch. Would people watch it if it was on TV? I don't know. Right. Yeah, people almost use it as as like a derogatory, like, oh, they're turning the league into flag football. But it's like, maybe I don't want pure football as it is to be flag football. But I would love there for there to be a flag football league. I mean, I I enjoy watching it. I've I've coached. There was like touch football, but kind of same idea. And it's just like it's such it's so high octane. It's it's really great. Man, I I I love uh, hearing about this too. Is like uh, when they have those high profile tournaments and we see Michael Vick tossing the ball (laughs) up there and. You know, it's all good fun. And the cool thing about uh, flag football too is that it, you know, you can play different variations of it, make it more authentic to the real game or 
uh, you know, follow the more, um, you know, uh, rule book set that is out there already. Um, that's something we're actually here at the agency we're working towards uh, in our hometown of Medicine Hat, where we're working towards getting a flag football league going there. So hopefully that builds up some excitement as well. But, you know, I want to um, move into one of our questions we ask everyone, and it sounds like you've heard a few of our uh, podcasts. So um, I'm going to start with the first one we always ask. Uh, it's one we really cherish and we get some good answers for uh, because it, you know, football's done a lot for us too. So um, Ben, what's the greatest lesson football's taught you? It's hard to pick one. And I think that everyone sort of struggles with that, but I think, I think there's something to do with, and this, it, anytime I talk about this, it always makes it sound like I'm comparing, you know, football to the military or something like that. And I don't think that's a, a fair comparison and that's not what I'm trying to do. There's something about having, putting your health and safety in someone else's hands and having them put theirs in yours that to me builds this bond that I don't think I've ever experienced anywhere else. Guys that I've played alongside or, you know, kids that I've coached as well, who have that faith in me, who know that I'm not going to put them in a bad situation. And, you know, they're going to do everything they can to protect the guy next to them. And they know they're safe because he's got his back as well. He knows this blitz is going to be picked up. He knows that, that they see this coming. He knows that his backside's protected, whatever it is. There's something about that in football that I never felt in any other sport, not to the same degree. You still feel, you know, there's benefits to any team sport. I don't care what it is, whether it's chess or, or, or badminton or soccer, rugby, whatever. Any sport has, has a tremendous number of benefits. Everybody should play sports. Everybody should be involved in sports. But football is special. And I don't know if it's because you will get hurt if, if things break down. I don't know if that's what it, what it is that differentiates it, but there does, it does feel a little bit like that military parallel that I was saying I wasn't intending, but there's, there's sort of a, I guess, a small percentage of that there is that you have to trust everyone else. You have to just do your job and trust that everyone else will do theirs. And if, if you all do, everything's going to be okay. And I think that's the biggest takeaway for me. There are a lot of other things about football that are awesome, but that feeling and that's why the bonds that you have in football are so strong. People talk about when they retire, you always ask any NFL, CFL player, ask them after they retire a year or two later, what do you miss most? And it's the guys in, in the locker room. It's, it's that brotherhood that you build. That's what they miss. And that's something that's really unique to the game of football. Wow. That's, I got no words on that, man. That's, that's incredibly well said. And it's, it's so true when you think about, yeah, the, the connectivity that needs to happen uh, with the 12 or 11 players you have on the field and, and what that all means, uh, you know, a missed block can mean, you know, you're putting your teammate in a bad position. So it's that trust in that everyone's done their assignment, done their homework and can pull that through so you can protect each other at the end of the day. Um, all right. So on a much more, more serious note, our final question uh, well, I have two because I want to bookend one, but uh, Ben Grant, does ketchup belong on craft dinner? You know, it's funny that you bring this up too, because I have a <laughs> recent experience with this. Uh oh, <laughs> I grew up, I grew up in a household that encouraged experimentation in cuisine. And so ketchup and craft dinner, hot dogs and craft dinner were usually the combo. My kids love craft dinner, although it's, it's not even craft brand now. It's some organic craft dinner that <laughs> still looks the exact same. I think oh, it's still yeah. the same stuff, but they've, you know, reboxed it or whatever, but they love it. They, they love craft dinner. They want it every day. We try to ration them. So the other day <laughs> as what I thought would be a nice treat, I put hot dogs and ketchup in the craft dinner. And for the first time in their lives, they didn't eat it. They took a couple oh, spoonfuls no. and wanted something else. So our household is divided on the matter. I say, yes, my kids and my wife say no. <laughs> I'll, you know, I'll take it. That's crazy, man. I it used to be like craft dinner was a treat. 
but then craft dinner with like hot dog slices and ketchup in there like that was like wow okay that's like a special is, occasion that's a special that's yeah a- like that's <laughs> You get that served at a wedding if you're lucky, you know, instead of yeah. steak. But. <laughs> Wieners and craft dinner, man. Yeah, I love that's it. that's awesome. We'll we'll make sure we add you to the pro KD side. It's been quite the split with our uh, interviews we've had on here so far. And then um, Ben, being a big Argos fan, uh, you mentioned one of your uh, memories that got you to become a fan. But what's your greatest memory as an Argonauts fan? There's something it's it's away from the game, actually, but I think this ties into what's so awesome about the CFL and why I wish so many more people would would embrace the CFL because it's so accessible. It's something that you don't have even the Twitter engagement. You know, you can you tweet at a a CFL player, they'll they'll respond to you and, and have a conversation with you. That doesn't happen in the NFL. It's it's not that they're not reading necessarily, but they're basically trained not to not to engage not to interact. And so few do. My story goes back to uh, my childhood again. And I was walking through a mall in Toronto and Pinball Clemens was signing autographs. He was, he was the star running back of the Toronto Argonauts at the time. And he's signing autographs. So I, I saw him there and I'm like, man, I got to go get an autograph. And there was only a couple of people in line, waited in line, got an autograph. I said, man, I'm such a big fan of yours. You know, we talked for a little bit. And then, you know, I, I got out of the way so that other people could, could get their autographs. I, an hour and a half later, I'm still in the mall. I've done some shopping. I got some food. I'm walking back through past the Foot Locker that he was signing autographs in. And I look over and he's sitting there at the table and there's no one in the line now. And I look over there and he waves and he goes, hey, Ben. And to me, the fact that not just a professional football player, Pinball Clemens, the star of the city, not only took the time to wave, he remembered my name an hour and a half later after kid after kid after kid who had been there for autographs. And that just, it, it, it completely like melted me uh, on, on the spot. It was just like, man, this, I will do anything uh, for this man. And, and <laughs> little did I know the rest of the country would eventually feel the same way and certainly the rest of Toronto uh, because yeah. he's, he's a king. He's, he's the, the greatest uh, of all time in terms of uh, you know a Toronto sports personality sports hero and sure. it uh, for me that was that's one of my favorite CFL moments of all time even though it wasn't on the field it was just that's that's what you get from a CFL player not maybe not every single one to that degree cuz he's been ball but you know that's that that personal interaction and that feeling of being included and part of part of the experience that was really cool I, I would have sobbed if I was that age and like Darian Durant or someone just said, Hey, Steve, I probably would have just sobbed on the spot. So that that's incredible. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's, that's why I love the CFL. And I'm sure Zach feels the same way. That's, that's great. Oh man. If Ricky Ray did that to me, I would have cried I would have <laughs> for sure cried. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, ben, as we mentioned at the top of the episode, you're very involved in producing content uh, CFL wise. And that I found you through your uh, wide receivers article through uh, Canadian football perspective. Uh, why don't you let our listeners know where they can find your work? Uh, you're obviously involved in a couple of different areas. And if you want to plug that here, it's also going to be in their show notes too, for anyone that wants to give Ben a follow or check out the websites you're contributing to. Or yeah, absolutely. You can find me on Twitter at Ben double underscore grant. The curse of having a very common first and last name is the double <laughs> underscore. And you can find all of my work at xsandargos.com. And you can also find some of my work at a Canadian football perspective. So you can give us uh, a follow on Twitter, either at X's and Argos.com, uh, sorry, either at, at X's and Argos or find all our stuff at X's and Argos.com or a Canadian football perspective. But yeah, be happy to f- have feedback. I love interacting with, with fans, even of the non Argo variety. Uh, I'm happy to hear what you guys have to say since we've taken all your best players. <laughs> i love it awesome ben thank you for your time my friend uh for anyone listening be sure to go check out ben's work and uh, we'll be back next week with a mock draft episode for the nfl and then maybe the cfl the week after that so uh, until then take care and godspeed